of magmatic emission. Usually, uh, there is a connection because between the width of the modeling margin and the amount of magnetism. Uh, are, are we able to just now we have a window in front of everything? Yeah. Okay. So usually, I think you should click the join audio maybe because see how the it's asking you to join with audio. I don't know. Maybe. No, no. Are you able to see it? No, it's a lot of bipolar, it's a lot of money. Okay, so that's correct. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So usually there's a connection and, and, and volcanic passive margins are considered generally narrow. This is due to the fact that during their formation, there's a lot of heat coming up and, and uh, uh, weakening the lithosphere and promoting strain localization towards a narrow zone of crustal necking. Uh, and so usually when we think of magma rich margin, we think of also a uh, narrow margin, but this is not uh, not necessarily the case, Nicholas. Thank you. Um, so we have this example, for, exa for example, from the Greenland margin, Southeast Greenland margin, where we see a very uh, narrow necking zone, less than 100 kilometers from an unthinned continental crust to an oceanic crust. On the other hand, uh, some margin, for example, the Moore margin from Scandinavia is quite wide with 300 kilometers width of, uh, of a margin separating the unthinned crust and the oceanic crust. And there's a, a question around what's, what controls it? Well, we, clearly we, we do not understand, uh, we have a good concept of what determines the width of the margin, especially in volcanic margins. So this will be one of the questions I'll try and answer. Second one is uh, what's dictate the sediment distribution in volcanic margin, in, in passive margins. So when in this map, you can see the distribution of sediments uh, in uh, around mar uh, margins around the world. And you can see that these uh, orange uh, yeah, polygons are, are uh, sediment thickness, uh, areas of, of orange, it, it appears white here, but areas of white uh, stains are uh, large amounts of sediments. And you see that the distribution is heterogeneous. We have some margins who, who accumulated more than 10 kilometers of sediments, while other accumulated less than one. And, and I'll, I'll try and, 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 uh, and, and answer what controls it. Uh, Usually, you think about it of uh, uh, two factors that control the sediment distribution. One is sediment supply, how much sediment you uh, flow into the margin. And the second is accommodation space, how much space you have in this margin to actually accommodate those sediments. I'll look at the, at, at the factors that, and processes that control the amount of accommodation, accommodation space inside these margins. Finally, the third chapter will focus on the interactions of, of uh, passive colonial margins and hotspots. Hotspots are uh, areas uh, thought to be fed by, by underlying mantle that, that is anomalously hot and feed the, the, the lithosphere with heat and, uh, and uh, magmatic addition. And when a, a, a continental margin, which is rich with sediments, goes over these hotspots, uh, we have a very good record of the vertical movement the lithosphere undergoes uh, and, and this signal is preserved in the sedimentary wedge of, of the continental margin. I'll try to answer what happens when these two meet. And uh, using the, the sedimentary record, I'll try to quantify uh, the um, effect of the hotspot over the margin itself. Thank you. So that will be the third chapter. I'll give a small introduction about the geological setting uh, of Eastern North America and the Atlantic margin. So what you see here in this map, just to get you oriented, this is the east coast of the United States. We have Boston here, New York, Washington. This is Nova Scotia, and this is the coastline. So we have the Atlantic here and the inland here. Uh, these are the Appalachian Mountains. And these mountains record uh, a very complex geological history. Basically, it records two full Wilson cycle. A Wilson cycle is when an ocean is being closed and reopened. Uh, there was a perceived one, but by one of the founders of plate tectonics, realized uh, due to the geology here uh, that this ocean was closed, opened, closed again, and then finally uh, creating the, the Atlantic uh, Ocean that, that is now today. But this opening and, and closing caused a very, um, very complex 
uh, mosaic of crustal terrains that are recruited to the margin and are stored in the Appalachians and in the margin itself. <clears throat> I, I put this uh, citation from Paul's uh, 1928, um, after he, he walked through the Appalachians and we saw that the resemblance between the Appalachians and the, the geology of the Appalachian and the geology on the other side of the Atlantic, he saw that it is, uh, quote, it is as if the Atlantic did not exist. Or in other words, as if Wagner, after all, were a true prophet. Wagner is Alfred Wagner, who first conceived the idea of, uh, of uh, continental grid before the late tectonic was, uh, was born. Thank you. So after its closure, it was opened. We have this Pangaea supercontinent that broke apart, forming this incipient uh, Central Atlantic Ocean right here. Uh, and it's uh, green, the Central uh, Atlantic uh, margins. Um, rifting of Pangaea started uh, during the Triassic. Uh, it, this, this rifting became volcanic around 2 million years ago. Uh, and at 100 million years ago, it broke apart forming the new ocean uh, and the volcanic margins at its side. The, the conjugate of this, uh, uh, of this mm -hmm. margin is the Moroccan uh, margin that they used to be uh, closed apart. Thank you. Yeah, uh, after rifting had finished, the entire area subsided, accumulating large amounts of sediments. For example, in this section from the Baltimore Kingdom Trap, this is a segment of the margin. You can see uh, the unthinned crust transition into a, uh, an oceanic crust, and on top of it, you have up to 15 kilometers of sediments accumulating on the margin. And during the Jurassic, uh, the first uh, 45 million years of the margin uh, after the margin was formed, there were mostly uh, carbonate uh, sedimentation, and afterwards, the, during the Cretaceous and Tertiary, most of, most of the sediments uh, accumulated were uh, silicic plastic. Thank you. Uh, in order to investigate the margin, I use the, the following data set. You can see on this map, this tight grid uh, is the seismic reflection lines I used. There are more than 71,000 kilometers of, of seismic reflection line. Most of this is uh, industry. Um, some of it is government. Uh, I constrained the stratigraphy using 48 wells that were tied to, to the, the seismic data. If to get constraints on the crustal properties and crustal thicknesses, I added 10 uh, published refraction lines, um, which were digitized and incorporated in the data set. And uh, also receiver function results. Uh, I, I used the magnetic anomaly to map the, the, the basalts, the, the, the magmatic addition to the crust, I'll show it later. And some hydrostratigraphic data in this area in the coastal plain to get some uh, coverage of, of how does the sedimentation look further in them. Um, because most of the seismic data was uh, in time or two-way travel time, it had to be converted into depth to have a, minute, a geological meaning. So for that, uh, I constructed two uh, velocity models, one for the shelf and one for the slope and rise. I took, uh, uh, for the shelf, I took the, all the well data that I have using the, the check shot. I uh, compiled a, a depth to time relationship, uh, regressed it uh, polynomially. So I had a, a velocity function I can use to convert two-way travel time um, values into depth. Uh, for the slope, I did not have uh, sloping right, did not have a lot of wells, so I used the uh, uh, first step uh, depth migrated uh, migration velocities and did the same uh, uh, the same drift. Thank you. So moving to the first chapter, um, this was published in JGR in 2020. Uh, it's called the role of pre-magmatic drifting in shaping the volcanic continental margin, uh, and it, it involves the try and answer these two questions of what dictates the structure and width of a volcanic continental margin. And in other words, in a more local perspective, what causes the low strike segmentation of the margin? And, and I'll, I'll explain in a minute what do I mean by low strike segmentation, Nicholas. So um, this is a, a total post drift thickness map of, of the entire margin. Uh, we have so, so we have uh, three segments, the Baltimore Canyon Trap, the Long Island Platform, and the Georgia's Bank Basin. And you can see that each of them has different uh, uh, sediment thicknesses. So we have a lot of thicknesses, a lot of sediments, like 15 kilometers of sediments in the Baltimore Canyon Trap, 
we almost don't have sediments in a Long Island platform. The Georgian Basin is, is up to 10 kilometers of sediments. So sediment distribution is entirely heterogeneous, they don't strike, and, and you, you kind of wonder why. To try and better understand it, we'll look at a strike section going through this line, showing the, the structure, the underlying structure of the, of the margin of the crust. So this is the Georgia Bank Basin. We see numerous snowball faults, rift basins. This is from the rifting stage itself. On top of it, we have uh, about up to 10 kilometers of crust, long island platform with thick crust, very thin sediments, and then going to the Baltimore Canyon Trough where we have very thin crust. This is the base of the crust, this is the Moho. And then on top of it, we have a wedge of uh, seaward dipping reflectors. These are basalts that were accreted to the margin during the final stages of rifting. And on top of it, we have a very thick sedimentary pile that was deposited during the post trip So each segment has its own unique characteristic, and it, you kind of wonder what controls it, why if they all worked at the same time, what happened that caused this one to look so different from the rest of them? To try and answer that, well, the main method was seismic interpretation. I mapped several things. First of all, some positive horizons, then the base of the positive, this is the, the blue horizons here, right? They delineate the senior strata and, and the crust from the from the post drift strata above it. And uh, next was the top of the basement. This is the red reflector here, which is offset by, by these faults. <clears throat> Third was the, the moho, you can see it here. This is the base of the crust. So some of the line actually image the base of the crust, allowing us to map the thickness of the crust itself. And third, um, <clears throat> our seaward dipping reflectors. This is what you see here. Uh, these are the, the, the um, geophysical manifestations of these basalt that were basalts that were fitted to the margin during the Drake. They have a very distinct, you don't see it here, but this is the anomaly and uh, the magnetic anomaly uh, of, of these basalts. So there's a good correlation between the seaward dipping reflectors and the magnetic anomaly, giving us confidence in interpreting the, these as basalts. So some, some results, wow, that looks, yeah. So the, uh, um, never mind. You, you have to believe me because uh, it doesn't look that good uh, on, the, on the screen, sorry for that. Well, first of all, we have the structural map of the top basement. You see the Georgian Bank Basin, very faulted, um, moderate depression, Long Island platform elevated, slightly faulted. And then the Baltimore Canyon Trap, we don't see a lot of faults, but we have a very deep depression. This is eight seconds, goes to 15 kilometers deep. Again, different characteristics of each and every segment of the margin. Here, uh, what I did is, is actually map those seaward dipping reflectors, those basalts. Uh, you can see this green dots, the same one you can see here. This is the landward edge of the seaward dipping reflectors. And you'll have to believe me on that, that they correlate with the magnetic anomaly. So, we can actually go to, uh, go to it to, toward along a, a contour of the magnetic anomaly and actually trace where these basalts end and say that this area is covered with basalts. So the Baltimore Canyon Trap has basalts at the at its base, while the Georgia Bank Basin shelf doesn't not have basalts. It has it only have them way down in the slope. So again, different characteristic for each and every segment. Yeah. Next was trying to map the thickness of the of the continental crust. We need the top of the crust, which is the top basement. We have that, but now we need the base of the crust, which is the Moho. So in a map view, you can see the the, uh, the depth of Moho as I picked on on the uh, on several uh, um, uh, deep penetrating seismic lines. But still, we have a lot of patches of areas where we don't have constraints regarding the depth to Moho, and then the crust. Uh, to, to kind of fill this gap, uh, I use published refraction results and receiver function results, and it gives me good constraints on how deep the continental crust is. And then we can, we are able to form a full crustal model of, of the margin. And uh, so how thick is the crust it is? If you go, because if you go to the next slide, and this is an, already an, an isopack of the continental crust itself. Uh, we see a thin crust in the Baltimore Canyon area, a thin crust in the outer Georgia Bank Basin, and thicker crust in areas that are more landward. So 
this gives us an insight of where did the crust thinned and how much. Next is, is taking this crust of thickness and, and looking at, uh, at, uh, at its gradient, how does it change uh, its space? And we see that in this area, those blue areas, there's not a lot of change in the crust of thickness. So it remains unthinned until we reach a certain line from which the crust starts thinning, people ask. And this line is called the hinge line, which separates the unthin continental crust from the thin continental crust. And we can quite clearly see um, uh, the area for each segment, the area that was thinned, the Georgia's Bank, the Baltimore Canyon, and the Long Island. Because, okay, going a little bit back to this crustal mosaic, to better understand what controls the variation along strike. So, again, here just to get you oriented, Georgia's Bank, Baltimore Canyon, Long Island platform. And from this map that was published by Hutcher 2010, we see that the, the, we have different crustal terrains that's underneath the basins, the, the Baltimore Canyon trough and the Georges Bank Basin. So the Georges Bank Basin underlines by the Maguma terrain, which is more felsy, meaning it, it is weaker and it's easily break apart, while the Avalon terrain has a more intermediate composition, meaning it's more resilient to, to stretching. Okay. Now let's combine all of this together. We have the hinge line, separating the, the unthin continental crust from the thin continental crust. We have the coverage of the basalts and we have the, the crustal terrains. And what we see is that while in the bottom of the trough, we have this Avalon resilient uh, uh, terrain, uh, it is covered with basalt and we get a very narrow margin between uh, the hinge line where we start thinning the crust and the basalts themselves moving into the continent ocean transition. This is less than, than 100 kilometers. While in the Georges Bank Basin, we have about 200 kilometers of thin crust, no results overlying the Megumetry. Now, to try and make an order out of it, I'll, I'll, I'll sketch, I'll sketch uh, a simple uh, cartoon illustrating the two different uh, basins. So this is the Baltimore Canyon Trough. Before it started rifting, we have the Avalon resilient terrain. And then in the Georges Bank Basin, we have also the Avalon, but we have this Meguma, which is weak. At the outer part of it. Once we start thinning in, in the Georgia, in the Baltimore Canyon Trough, the, it's it's very hard to break it. So extension is is spread over a large area. We, we don't really thin the crust. While in the Georgia Bay Basin, we have the weakest link in the chain, Maguma, which is faulted and the crust is thin. And only later, so this is the pre-magmatic drifting, right? And only later, when we start incorporating magma into the process, at around two hundred million years ago. We can hit and, and break Avalon, allowing us to thin the crust while adding magma to the crust. While in the Georges Bank Basin, this is a curious seaward, this is a curious seawards of the thin communal crust. And this is why we get a very wide, thin uh, area in the Georges Bank Basin uh, before we reach the continental breakup. While in the, in the Baltimore Canyon Trap, we have this very narrow margin overlying, uh, underlying, sorry, with uh, SDRs <laughs> and results. So to sum it up, sorry, sum up the first chapter, Baltimore Pinner Trough is a typical volcanic margin, very narrow, uh, necking zone overlaid by uh, a lot of uh, magmatic material. The Georgia Bank Basin is broader, has crustal and little filtering over 200 kilometers. The magmatism took place beyond the shelf edge. The different, the different widths originate from the amount of pre-magmatic thinning. So actually the stage that predated magmatism is the one responsible for the width of the margin. And the cause for the variation is actually the, the um, pre-rift rheology of the crust of the different basins. Thank you. Let's move on to the second chapter. So we dealt with rifting until now. Let's talk about what happens after rifting starts and the margin starts to subside and accumulate post sediments. Um, this is the, the total post sediment uh, thickness you've seen before. Let's move on. Uh, I mentioned the word accommodation space at the beginning. This is uh, how much, this determines how much sediments could be accumulated in the margin. So it's actually the volume available within the basin to accommodate the influx of sediments. But what controls accommodation space? 
So we have this several processes that actually uh, controls it, but in a simple cartoon, you can say that you can raise the sea floor, the, the, you can raise the global sea level, creating more space for sediments to accumulate, or you can sub subside the, 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 the uh, sea floor, creating more space. So there are several processes that actually can, can cause this. We have uh, horizontal tectonic movements, which we know we don't have in the inland, in the Eastern North American margin because it's passive. We can have the mantle dynamic topography, we can have salt, we can have compactions of sediments, uh, which is quite a lot. Uh, today I'll focus only on, on three, uh, three of these processes and elaborate them. Uh, if you want more, when the paper will be out, you can, you can go ahead and read it. Go ahead. So in order to investigate the, the, the accommodation space, and uh, we, I had to get a good hold of, of sediment distribution throughout the, the, the entire post trip period. Uh, so I divided the post trip into seven intervals going from the middle Jurassic up until the, the Neogen. You can see the isopaths over there for each and every period. And you can also look at it with a graph. So we have the, the oldest period here, the middle Jurassic and the youngest here. And this is the volume of each and every isopax, how much sediment accumulated at each and every uh, time step on the margin. And what you can see immediately is you get this general trend of decrease until the paleogen, and then another increase during the new gen. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll start with the effect of the sin rift lithosphere structure. So within the, the lithosphere during rifting, and it leaves this signal. Uh, and try and understand what this signal means on the on the post drift subsidence and post drift accommodation space. Um, we have two maps: one of the crustal thickness and one of the total post drift thickness. And what we can see is that areas of very thin crust, like the bottom of Kenner Trap, are overlain by thick piles of sediments here, and uh, the same in the Georgia Beck Basin, where we have thin crust, we have thick sediments. And when we have thick crust, we have thin sediments. So there's clearly a connection. Uh, and we can try and use the continental crust as a proxy for what the literature has underwent during drifting crust. And what is that connection? Uh, so good thing we have Mackenzie in 1978 uh, proposing his pure shear uniform stretching model which means trying to predict how much subsidence an area will go after it had been stretched. And what he said is that, okay, let's say we thin the entire lithosphere and the, there's no void. So because of that, we get hot stenosphere rising beneath the rift area. And the cooling of this stenosphere during the post rift actually caused this area to get denser and subside, accumulating sed sediments on top of it. So if we follow Mackenzie, you can say, that, okay, let's say we know how much the crust has been thin. We can predict quantitatively how much sediments we're supposed to have on top of this thin crust. So there's a connection between crust and thickness, uh, a quantified model connection between sediment thickness and crust of thickness. Uh, <clears throat> one other thing is that because it's a, it's a, a, it's a, a conductive, uh, a conductive uh, process, it means that it will be very fast at the beginning and then it will slow down uh, afterwards. And you can see in this section from the Baltimore Canyon Trap that during the, the middle Jurassic, we had eight kilometers of sediments during the first 26 million years. That's less, more than, than a half of the entire sediment thickness <clears throat> in less than a, in more or less a quarter of the margin the entire lifespan. So it decays over time. But is it eight kilometer a lot? Is it is it uh, uh, very few? How can we say we have to quantify it? And then for that we I constructed a model in the class uh, uh, that, that that compares Mackenzie's prediction to our observation. So I plotted crustal thicknesses against middle Jurassic thicknesses. So this is sediment and this is crust for each and every segment. And immediately you can see that they have different trends. So for a specific crust of thickness in the Long Island platform, you get uh, less sediments than you get for the Georgia Bank Basin and even less than in the Baltimore Canyon Trough. 
So his model is saying that for a specific pattern thickness, you should get a specific sediment thickness it simply doesn't work. And there's this deviation. And, and, and in order to, to uh, quantify the deviation, I took his model and based on, on the observed crustal thicknesses, I modeled what should be the mid rustic thicknesses. And this is this gray line that you see here, which more or less uh, goes along with the trend you, you see in the Long Island platform, but it's, it's, it's not enough. It's simply not enough for the George's Bank Basin, which is here in blue, and the Baltimore Canyon Trap here in there. We have too many sediments compared to, to the expectation. And um, trying to solve it, and, and, and uh, it, it's not only uh, more, it's, it's about uh, three times more in the Baltimore Canyon Trap. So it's a big anomaly, uh, was not uh, observed before, and, and, and we, we tried to figure out what could cause this uh, anomaly. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm working on a model now that will try and explain it, but among the, the, the candidate could be increased magnetism, for example, because the crust that you see was added by magmatism. It's not only stretch crust, it's also accreted crust. So I tried to model it here in blue, in, in, in black. It fits more or less the George's Bank, but it cannot, cannot still cannot explain the bottom of the drop. You can all think of increased mantle temperature or non-uniform stretchings or mantle dynamic topography, all kinds of processes that I'm not trying to work on uh, after the PhD has uh, stopped and then uh, has ended. I'm trying to figure out this uh, anomalous uh, subsidence. Uh, in the next phenomenon, which is also anomalous, is the uh, widening of the depth center during the posture. So you can see here uh, a section from the southern Baltimore Canyon Trap, uh, different color mean different, different periods, uh, and, and the, these circles mean the landward pinch outs or ancient shorelines, actually. That means that when this blue unit was deposited, this was the shoreline it was much further up. And uh, this is weird because this is already over a thin crust that should be subsided. So something uplifted the flanks of the margin, causing them to go to be at sea level during the time of the position. So we have the age of it, we know the vertical position of it, and we can even quantify how much of an uplift occurred over there. Uh, and uh, this uplift decays over time, you see that uh, this area subsided, allowing for sediments to reach further inland and inland and inland. And during the Middle Cretaceous, uh, it, it reached the foothills of the Appalachians. Uh, and I've tracked this uh, pinch outline uh, originally, and you can see that uh, 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 this is a regional phenomenon. So the entire flank of the margin was uplifted by uh, uh, several hundreds of meters, probably two to three hundred meters. Uh, Originally, and uh, there's a question what caused this uplift. And again, I, I tried to model it. And, and my, my view of trying to model it is, is model a non uniform stretching of the lithosphere, meaning that the mental lithosphere actually thins more than the crust itself, which causes the uh, rising, isostatic rising of the flanks of the margin. Uh, and uh, after um, uh, pulling this area subside, allowing for, for the transgression of sediments upwards. And I played a little bit with the numbers and I, I realized that, uh, uh, so this is this is the, the, the model and you can see the, a nice fit between the Baltimore Canyon trough and the, and the orange model of, of uh, over here, which means that the mental lithosphere was, was uh, thinned two times more than the crust was thinned in this area. Uh, so we get a nice fit and, and we have a, a nice explanation for it. Uh, that will be a second conclusion. Uh, and last, going to, to the Neogen anomaly. This is the Neogen, the last 30 million years of the lifespan of the margin. Uh, and if you remember this graph, we saw the decay of, of, uh, of volumes of sediments. And then we have a very peak, a very large peak at the end. So sediment accumulation really peaked during the last 30 million years. Uh, part of it has to do with the increase of, of thermal line circulation during the Neogen, which uh, allowed sediment drift to be accumulated on the, on the rise. You can see this very thick, more than two and a half kilometers thick pile of sediment accumulated on the rise. But part of it has to do with the shelf. The shelf also uh, uh, accumulates more than uh, almost two, two uh, kilometers of sediments. And there's a question why, what caused this 
uh, this uh, increased accumulation. Go ahead. So it could be sediment supply, but uh, a, a publication who worked on this actually backstripped the area of the, the Baltimore Canyon uh, trap shell. And what they realized, they see this nice decay in subsidence since the formation of the margin, and something happened in 30 million years. Instead of going this way, it again subsided anonymously uh, in this part, meaning this is not about sediment supply. It's not only about sediment supply, but this is actually something pulling down the, the shelf uh, in the last 30 million years. Uh, and there were several propositions by previous work. Uh, a lot of them were talking about mental dynamic topography. They took the Farallon slab coming from the West United States and, and dropping down, drawing down the, the margin uh, during the last 30 million years. But it doesn't fit our isoflux because you see it's very, lo very localized with the Baltimore Canyon trap. You don't see it in the George's Bank area. You don't see it anywhere else. So that has to be something more localized. And, and my idea was that uh, maybe this huge load of sediments that actually was, was uh, accumulated on the rise actually flexurally downwrapped the shelf itself allowing for more sediments to, to accumulate them. One other thing that you see is that there's a nice correlation between the, the, uh, the um, architecture of the depot center on the shelf to the hinge lines, which separates the unthin crust and the thin crust, meaning it has some rheological control over it, which goes quite well with the flexural uh, uh, mechanism, because we know that the rigidity uh, of, of the lithosphere is very susceptible to, uh, to its, uh, to its um, uh, rheology. And if you have a thick sediment pile and a thin crust, maybe we're able to flex this area uh, easily than um, uh, areas that have not been thinned and, and covered with sediments. So to conclude, the, the thin reef lithosphere structure of the margins determined the first order architecture of the margin, meaning that if you can tell me in, in the first order where the margin was thinned, I can tell you where we will accumulate more sediments. Also, the margin is, is, is considered a classic passive margin. Its post reef sedimentary archive contains multiple phenomena that deviate from the expected passive conduct. We saw, we saw a lot of anomalies that doesn't go along with the book. We kind of shake this passive, I kind of shake this passive perception of, 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 of margin. And I think a dynamic a passive margin maybe will be a better term because obviously uh, this deterministic a uh, way of thinking of, okay, let, let me know the thinning factor, let me know uh, sea level, I can tell you how much sediments will accumulate uh, in the, here or there. No, it's it's much more complex. And for example, the anomalous early post trip subsidence in the Baltimore Canyon Trough was caused by uh, non-uniform stretching, mental dynamic topography, probably hydrothermal cooling that uh, it pulled the, the leaf sort of faster. The flanks of the margin were uplifted during the Jurassic, uh, increased neogen accommodation space is not related to mental dynamic topography as previous thought, but probably has to do with flexural down wrapping of the margin. Let's move on to the last chapter uh, the interaction of, of hotspots with continental margin or utilizing the sedimentary archive found in continental margin to get to know something about how new hotspots uh, affect the vertical motions of the lithosphere. <clears throat> so, Hotspot, hotspots adds heat and magma to the lithosphere, which induce vertical motions, cause them to rise and then subside down. Uh, some of these vertical motions are permanent, other are transient, meaning that after uh, 100 million years, you will not know that a hotspot has passed there. Uh, and quantifying this motion may provide insights into the deep rooted processes that involve hotspots. So, Usually, we know hotspot either in land or at sea. So, for example, in Hawaii, you, you can see the mountain change, uh, but it's very hard to really quantify the, the amount of vertical motions there because you don't have a lot of sediments. You can there's nothing to record it. And on land, we have the same thing. We can we can date the the magmatic, the magmatic the, uh, structures, but we cannot really say how how high did they go and, and when did they subside back. So I'll try to use the, the, the issue of American margin to kind of quantify it. Um, and 
Fortunately, we have the uh, great metal hotspot that crosses the margin. It starts started some, somewhere uh, near Ontario, Canada, and it is today located east of the Mid-Atlantic Bridge. Mm -hmm. And during his, uh, his uh, track, he passed under the George's Bank Basin uh, at around 105 <laughs> million years ago. Uh, we can see it in, in multiple magmatic structures on land and at the deep ocean. But here we have a gap. We don't see anything. There's no magmatic additions. Maybe they're covered with sediments. We don't, there, there, there are no reports of any magmatism occurring in this area, um, which, is, which is quite weird. It's, it's, it's a big gap. Uh, it's several hundred kilometers. So one of the things you see when you look at the Georgia Bank Basin, this is a, a deep line crossing the basin. You see this huge unconformity here truncating down to the Jurassic sediments. Uh, you cannot see it here, unfortunately, but uh, the extrapolation of, of the horizons allows us to quantify how much of sediment is eroded. And the estimation that are about uh, 850 meters of sediments that were eroded. That means uplift of the basin over uh, sea level, above sea level, and truncation uh, and erosion of sediments at that time. Uh, <clears throat> the, so the amplitude is 8, 850 by mapping it spatially. We can say that the wavelength is at least 300 kilometers, at least 300 kilometers wide area that was uplifted. Uh, yeah. from, from the geometry, the fact that it's flat, we know that there was no subsidence following the uplift. So it was it was uplifted and basically stayed there. Uh, and, and we can say the timing by, by dating the rising using wells, the, the time it, it occurred between uh, um, 97 and 86 million years ago. Uh, that's when, uh, <clears throat> when the uplift occurred. This is more or less 10 million years after the hotspot had passed, but there's nothing else going on. There's no tectonics and no major events. This is the only thing that happens. So, we assume that it has to do with the hotspot, but it's delayed by 10 million years. Um, what caused the denudation? Okay, hotspot is nice, but what is actually the mechanism that caused the uplift and erosion? Uh, we looked at a sedimentary architecture of the wedge that was accumulated during the formation of the unconformity and tried to mimic it using a, a stratigraphic model and fit it with an uplift curve that would create such a geometry. And our result, wow, it's, it's good. you can barely see the scale here. And our result is that we came up with the fact that uh, uplift was very fat at the, first at the beginning and it had to decay over time, uh, which fits an uh, isostatic retrogulorium. It's like if you take a mountain and you start eroding it, first it will go up very fast and then uh, erosion will decay over time. So we see more or less the same thing here. Uh, so, and, and this erosion occurred over about 10 million years. Uh, but what caused this erosion? Uh, next, we, uh, we uh, uh, um, establish a flexible isostatic model, considering the width of the anomaly, uh, the, anomaly the, 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 the uplifted region, 300 meters, 300 kilometers, sorry. And, and several uh, elastic thicknesses of the lithosphere, and which gave us this relation. And uh, <clears throat> we also uh, uh, calculated what should be the, the height, the thickness of the load beneath the lithosphere, uh, and what should, should be its, uh, its uh, change of density in the lithosphere to cause an 850 meters uh, of, of denudation. Uh, the, saving you from the, from the messy details, I'll say that a physical light and body added to the lithosphere would be three, between 300 and, and uh, 115 kilometers wide. This should be the width of this body. Uh, its density should be reduced between 80 and uh, 10 kilometers and 10 ki kilogram per meter cube. Uh, and we saw from published seismic to tomography at 75 kilometers that we do have this wide anomaly of what seems to be a light and low velocity body in the metal, the mental that would fit it. So taking it all into consideration, the, the, the most probable scenario would be that the hotspot had passed and triggered some kind of upwelling in the mantle, which caused uh, the rising of a depleted astanosphere to be adhered to the lithosphere, causing 
the flexural bulge and the, and the lithosphere and the denudation of the sediments that overlap. To conclude, the Georgia Basin uh, was permanently uplifted and eroded uh, by at least 850 meters. 10 million years after the passage of, passage of the Great Meteor Hotspot, the uplift resulted from an isostatic response to a subatmospheric mantle lighting. The hotspot probably triggered the rising of the depleted mantle body toward the base of the system. And that's it. Yeah, I would, I would really like to thank a lot of colleagues and friends that were escorting me along the way, sure. uh, gave me some good and probably some bad advice as well. Okay, <laughs> some good advice. Thank you very much. It was a great journey. Uh, my, I'd like to thank my supporters and my committee members who would not be here, Professor Greg Mountains and, uh, and Dr. Debbie Hutchinson from the uh, Rutgers and the USGS, and my, my dear supervisor, Professor Rittenbrink, who I hope is still awake, and Professor Schaffner, thank you very much. And of course, my dear family, I cannot do it without you. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you very much. It was an impressive presentation and an impressive work, probably much more than you presented. No, I could not present everything interesting much. <laughs> thank you very much. So, um, yeah, we have uh, questions. Thank you. If you could see the back to the end of the first chapter with pictures of the lifting. Yeah. You mean the, the cartoons? The... Yes, I'm listening. Uh, if you consider the extension rate during the lifting, because um, at least as I know, it, it has a very big effect, for instance, as here under the, uh, the, the dead sea reef, because it has a very, very uh, so, tension, have a uh, narrow reef. Okay, so please, yeah. Yeah, thank you guys. So, uh, that's a great question. First of all, um, if I understand correctly for the Dead Sea Reef, it's a more of a transform, which also kind of affect the, the, the um, uh, area of, of crust of thinning. But yes, of course, uh, the, the, in, in general, the faster you thin the crust, the more uh, narrow you can expect the necking zone uh, to be. Uh, so if if I remember correctly, the the oil pore uh, is actually located to the south, meaning that this part was extended faster than this part. So you'd expect it to be the other way around, right? You'd expect this one to be narrow because it was extended fast, and this one to be uh, to be uh, wider because it was extended uh, during this, uh, uh, um, uh, using a. a a lower extension rate, and you get the other way around. So we kind of disqualify this uh, this uh, proposition. But but yeah, definitely extension rates. Uh, we haven't modeled it, right? It's it's only you know based on observations, but we haven't modeled it. Uh, but extension rate, of course, is a is a key factor. Uh, uh, yeah, I meant that. I meant uh, actually on the side sheet, you you don't have such lifting structures. I meant specifically the. Lifting, meaning that that method of component in the okay. 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 And also, um, at least, at least um, from the modeling, for instance, it is reported that also actually demonstrated in the second part, then the faster sedimentation you have, the larger subsidence you could. Of course. Operate. Of course, of course. So, so yeah, I, I, that's going to, to the to the second chapter. Uh, when I when I uh, when I modeled the thickness of, of uh, how thick should should the sediment pile be, I took into account both the tectonic or thermal uh, subsidence and the isostatic response, which is what you mean that you load the lithosphere with sediments and you get more subsidence. So yeah, it was accounted for that. I. I I can add that uh, 
we know from wells that both margins, both the fish, the fish segments were filled with sediments, meaning that it was not uh, uh, an issue of different sediment supply causing more subsidence in one than in the other. But both, all of them were filled with sediments, and it gives us a, a way of uh, of um, uh, examining them in in a, in an objective uh, way because they had undergone the same. Uh, a sediment sediment uh, condition, so sediment loading condition. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Very tough. Very tough. And I remember when we just started, I asked Louis Kendrick uh, about the, the, the subject, and he said that this area has been studied so much. So, so in hopes that you will contribute to new knowledge. So you did it. You contributed a lot of new knowledge. So it's really nice to see. My question is related to that. I, as you know, I'm working on really uh, young sediments, uh, but I, I, I know, I remember that the global sea level in food was um, mostly um, reconstruction in the passive margins of the, um, the the eastern part of the of North America, uh, and I wonder if this new insight changed the global uh, uh, sea level pool. Um, they haven't yet. <laughs> okay, yeah. And, but yeah, so basically, you're talking about the new New Jersey margin, which yeah. is here. One of its constructors was uh, Red Mountain, which is part of my committee. Uh, that's the famous Ken Miller Pillars. Uh, and yes, I mean, their contribution is especially relevant to the Nugent uh, from, uh, yeah. from this part. And you get this nice oscillation of yeah. Delta with 18 and all of that. And they uh, they put a lot of effort back in the days was uh, to to backstrip the, the, the margin and really reconstruct the vertical motion of it. Uh, and they also noticed this, uh, this deviation and they gave it into uh, metal dynamic topography. But Definitely, their assumption, the general assumption, is that this margin is as passive as it can be, yeah, and it's and it's not. It's not. I mean, people people have said it before. I think I've quantified it a little bit. Uh, I gave it like a special a special dimension and, and also strengthening the idea that it's not passive and it's it, it gives us it gives us this challenge of really reconstruct what does reconstruction of global sea level even mean? Do we even have a passive margin anywhere that we can actually use as a as a datum? Uh, yeah. So I think if you better understand the processes that actually controls the accommodation space uh, and quantify them, you can have a better perception going back to the sea level curve. But as it is, it's a big problem. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'll jump over with a question here. Um, chapter three, you were talking about it just towards the end, and just because you covered basically my time period for my PhD as well. So um, you said that you find it roughly uh, around like 90 to 80 million years ago, but the hot spot is too far. Um, Cross the George's Bank at 105 without magmatic expression. Yeah, um, but then I thought you mentioned something that you saw the expression, but it was like 10 million years too late. Exactly. And you said there's no tectonics at that time. Mm -hmm. And I believe that time span was like 90 to 80 or like 85 to 90, 97 to 86. This 97 to 86. Okay, yeah. perfect. So, because at, at, at 97 million years ago, you have the 78 orogeny that's happening on the west coast of North America. Admittedly, it's an active margin and separated by a continent, a very yeah. large continent in North America, but the effects of the Sevier orogeny were going thousands of kilometers from the west coast, the foreland basin that formed, um, to the point where even um, the, uh, like the, the Turonian, the early upper Cretaceous, there's a proposed um, connection for the western interior seaway out to the east as well, out across Hudson. And then you have the Laramide orogeny that starts at roughly 80 million years ago. So would there not be some sort of, I realize the actual active tectonics that are happening on the West Coast may not be affecting there, but you said there's no evidence of tectonics happening at the time. 
you're saying that the stuff happening on the west coast couldn't be impacting that far? That, that that's a great question. And I, I what I tried to do is is I took those everything, every tectonic event happening at the same time, the Atlantic, North Atlantic, over and, and just look at them and there are stuff that happens. But, but it, sorry, including west side, like including Pacific and West yeah, Coast. Yeah, right. okay. yeah. At, at a certain point, you reach, uh, uh, you can correlate everything with everything, but uh, then you start thinking, this is, you know, how many steps do I have to take? Yeah. Not only that, it's, it is so far that how can an event that occurs 2,000 kilometers or 3,000 kilometers away could have an expression of 300 kilometers here, and you don't see anything here or even here. So it's so localized. And if you think about it, if something that far happens, it should affect and has effect here, it should affect a much broader area. So it is very localized and it, it's, it's, it nicely fits this uh, geophysical or seismic anomaly in the mantle that is just over there. So I, I, when I say there's no tectonic event, I mean, you know, in the, in the next, yeah. uh, I don't know, 500 uh, kilometers, uh, 1,000 kilometers, nothing happens. That, that was uh, my intention. I believe that if something occurring in the, in the West Coast would affect the East Coast, the, the, the East Coast, it would be much, much broader, has a very large, much larger wavelength than 300 kilometers. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because it could just like have your 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 um your four bulge. So we get our deep basin in the western north west, western interior seaway is running through like Colorado, Utah, Arizona. And it's huge. The the the, 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 the interior seaway. Right. That's what I mean. But so we have a we have a, a 1500 to 2000 kilometer wide seaway. The majority of the basin was was not that wide. And you have this big, large, then four balls going out. Now you're starting to get into Ontario where you showed all the erogenies that we've had in Ontario going back to two and a half million years ago and meteor impacts and all this. I'm just wondering, like, as that bulge now gets to all of this original continental, like we have some of the oldest rocks. Uh, in the world, making up the, the North American craton. Now, maybe as this bulge hits there, maybe I don't know. Maybe your, sediments are, being, maybe your sediments are being forced into where the so maybe the eastern. The idea would be then that the eastern part of North American continent is way more heterogeneous than just mm -hmm. a simple mm -hmm. split. Yeah. So we say this uh, a superposition of the general. Uh, tonic forcing with the uh, heterogeneous uh, lithosphere, and that, that bulge kind of comes and hits the rocks of Ontario and Quebec, which are which are crazy. Yeah, you've seen them. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I just yeah. It, it's interesting when you when you cross over exactly what I'm looking at on the west side mm -hmm. from a climate perspective. Definitely. Um, yeah. That's all. I have a question. You have nice maps over there of the. Isopack maps. Can you show them again? Yes. I don't know where it was. I think it's the first chapter, second chapter. Like four. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I was wondering if nothing to do with what you're talking, but if you see the Chesapeake impact path. Oh yeah. 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 One second. You can see it in the in the top basement map. One second. You and maybe you can tell one. Me. Yeah, maybe we'll tell them what is the Chesapeake. Yeah, this is the this all over there is the Chesapeake impact uh, crater, actually a meteor that hit it the eastern. Uh, this is during the Eocene, if I remember correctly. Thirty-five million. Yeah, and uh, caused a, a, a perfect that did that it actually caused a depression in the um, in the in the crust uh, beneath the the margin. That uh, actually it's uh, the coastal plain here. So this yeah. top top basement is. Uh, Cretaceous. No, what is no, that? That's uh, um, 200. Uh, so it result. broke it, so it, it penetrated the yep. entire uh, sedimentary column, Cretaceous, and everything, and hit the area. You, know, you have nice seismic line across it, showing you this beautiful cool. structures. Yeah, it's very cool. Okay. More questions from the virtual world? There are questions. Mm. No. Okay. Well, um, yes.